Welcome back, friends. You are listening to the Juice Box Podcast. Dr. Blevins has been on the podcast a couple of times. He's talked about GLP medications, inhaled insulin, and today he's going to share with us the importance of testing for type 1 diabetes. Please don't forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. Are you an adult living with type 1 or the caregiver of someone who is and a U.S. resident? If you are, I'd love it if you would go to t1dexchange.org slash juicebox and take the survey. When you complete that survey, your answers are used to move type 1 diabetes research of all kinds. So if you'd like to help with type 1 research, but don't have time to go to a doctor or an investigation, and you want to do something right there from your sofa, this is the way. t1dexchange.org slash juicebox. It should not take you more than about 10 minutes. If you're looking for community around type 1 diabetes, check out the Juice Box Podcast private Facebook group, Juice Box Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Dexcom G7, the same CGM that my daughter wears. Check it out now at Dexcom.com slash juicebox. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by US Med. USMed.com slash juicebox or call 888-721-1514. Get your supplies the same way we do from US Med. All right, Dr. Blevins, welcome back. I appreciate you coming back on the show again. How have you been? Hey, good, Scott. It's good to be here. I've been I've been doing well. Excellent, excellent. I um, asked you back today, and you were interested in talking about screening for type one diabetes, which is kind of all the rage at the moment. And I was hoping that you could help me to understand why it's so important. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think it's a really big deal that people start really moving toward the screening because there's some really good reasons for it, and the reasons are getting better and better. I think people need to be as educated as possible about about who may develop type 1 diabetes and pick things up as early as possible. This is a concept in medicine in general is pick up things early, screen, find out risk. And I think it's the entering the, the real world when it comes to type 1 diabetes. And I think everyone out there should be very, very educated about this. Do you think that it matters if you have type one in your family line or not, do you think everyone should be screened? You know, when it comes down to it, the, the, the people that have the highest risk are people who have diabetes in the family line or they're called first degree relatives, which means like brothers, sisters, children, parents, people, and even, even probably second degree, but that's the highest risk group. And I'll, I'll, I'll point out probably a little in a little bit that that's certainly not going to get everyone. Mm -hmm. by any means, but that's a really good place to start. Okay. And people with diabetes are in the driver's seat. They can tell their family, hey, you need to get screened. They can get their kids screened. They can tell their brothers and sisters and, you know, family members, get screened and find out. Yeah. So I guess the most obvious reason to know ahead of time is to not be in DKA at the time. I was going to say the shit hits the fan, but sort of when, you know, push comes to shove and, and diabetes is here, you can be ahead of I mean, do you see that as the as the first reason for knowing? Yeah, you should say when the ketones hit the fan, I think that might be more more okay. But the, the answer is yes. A few years ago, a, a study showed that 60% of people in this country were in DKA when they found out they had type 1 diabetes. And mm-hmm. we'd sure like them to to know sooner than that. That's a that's a, a traumatic event and into the hospital sick as they can be. I mean, sometimes ketoacidosis can even kill you. And and so you don't want to wait until that time to find out you have type 1. There, there's some studies around the world in which people were screened, children were screened, either because of risk, like family history. And there was, there was one study that just screened everybody. And the finding was that when people are 
or di- or found to have the risk, that means the positive antibodies, and this is kind of a know your antibodies concept, then they knew and they could they could uh, check themselves. And when their sugar started going up, they got it treated. And it was insulin, of course, instead of just not knowing anything and suddenly having the symptoms, the weight loss, the frequent urination, the drinking a lot of water, you know, the typical ones, that, and then end up in the hospital. So, yeah, it makes a difference. I found that over the last year or so, I'm hearing more people talk about the stages of type 1. And I have to admit that prior to us paying attention to screening, I never really heard people talk about that so much. Like, are you, you're in stage 1, stage 2, stage 3. Can you break down for me what those are? Yeah, sure. Stages of type 1 diabetes. And, you know, we know about type 1 diabetes. We know about type 2. We're not talking about that. We're talking about stages of type 1 and and this does lead to a level, I think, of complexity because it requires that people kind of memorize some more numbers and some more characteristics. But you, you start staging things when you start finding ways to intervene and interact. So that's always a good thing. Mm-hmm. And so stages of type one. Now, remember, each one of these stages technically would equal the diagnosis of type one. There's stage one. Stage one is also, or might be called pre-symptomatic. Stage one is when the blood sugar is completely normal, but the person has greater than or equal to two autoantibodies. So you have to have the antibody testing here to even diagnose stage one. So stage one, the sugar can be normal. It is normal. And you can still say the person has type one if they have greater than or equal to two antibodies. We'll talk about the antibodies here in a minute. And then there's stage two. Well, stage two is a progression from stage one. And these people have greater than or equal to two of those antibodies that we'll talk more about. And now they have blood sugar elevation, but they don't have the elevation you would normally associate with diabetes. They have an elevated fasting sugar, and and it typically is going to be between about 100 and 125. Mm -hmm. And you know that 126 and above equals diabetes. So these are people that are in this kind of like pre-diabetes blood sugar range. Uh, They have the antibodies. So they're not, they don't have normal glucoses. They don't have diabetes range glucoses yet. They have the antibodies and they have this kind of pre-diabetes picture. And if you do an oral glucose tolerance test, these people will have glucoses that fit into the, we call it impaired glucose tolerance range. And and then stage three, so let me just summarize that one again. Antibodies plus glucoses that are elevated, but not in the high range, not in the in the diabetes range. Stage three is now, okay, greater than or equal to two antibodies, and now you have high blood sugars. Yeah. And you could you could be diagnosed as having diabetes because of the blood sugar, the fasting being over 126 could be diagnosed if the, the glucose is greater than 200 after a glucose tolerance test at two hours or just high, and the A1C is typically elevated over or greater than or equal to 6.5. That's stage three. And I'll back up a second and say the A1C in stage two is going to be in the prediabetes range, which is going to be 5.6 up to about 6.4. Okay. Greater than 5.6 up to 6.4. So those are the stages. And, and the bottom line is each stage requires, well, at least stage one and two. When you have stage three, the antibodies are helpful, but you have diabetes already. And and so stage one and stage two do require antibodies to be measured. Does everyone who enters stage one make it to stage two? I have always disliked ordering diabetes supplies. I'm guessing you have as well. It hasn't been a problem for us for the last few years, though, because we began using U.S. Med. You can, too. USmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514 to get your free benefits check. U.S. Med has served over 1 million people living with diabetes since 1996. They carry everything you need from CGMs to insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies and more. I'm talking about all the good ones, all your favorites. Libre 3, Dexcom G7, and pumps like Omnipod 5, Omnipod Dash, Tandem, and most recently, the Eyelet Pump from Beta Bionics. The stuff you're looking for, they have it at U.S. Med. 888-721-1514 or go to usmed.com slash juicebox to get started now. Use my link to support the podcast. That's usmed.com slash juicebox or call 888-721-1514. 
you can manage diabetes confidently with the powerfully simple Dexcom G7. Dexcom.com slash juice box. The Dexcom G7 is the CGM that my daughter is wearing. The G7 is a simple CGM system that delivers real-time glucose numbers to your smartphone or smartwatch. The G7 is made for all types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, but also people experiencing gestational diabetes. The Dexcom G7 can help you spend more time in range, which is proven to lower A1C. The more time you spend in range, the better and healthier you feel. And with the Dexcom Clarity app, you can track your glucose trends, and the app will also provide you with a projected A1C in as little as two weeks. If you're looking for clarity around your diabetes, you're looking for Dexcom. Dexcom.com slash juice box. The answer is a very high percent. If you look at if you look at like lifetime risk of developing diabetes going from stage one to stage two and then stage two to stage three, it's it's up there. If a person has greater than or equal to two autoantibodies, their risk of developing and, and this is with or just this is a stage one one and stage two. And some people say there's a pre-stage one with maybe one antibody, but forget about that. We're talking stage one and stage two. Yeah, about 44% go on to have diabetes in five years, 70% in 10 years, and lifetime risk 100%. If a person has greater than or equal to two autoantibodies, whatever stage they may be in. So some people ask me just what you ask, and they say, well, I might have an antibody or two, but I may have two antibodies, but uh, will I really go on to have diabetes? And the answer is, yeah, you will. In some medical conditions, people can have antibodies and they don't go on to have the the manifestation. But in, in this one, the data says you do. And so we're testing now because there's something that can be done about this to kind of slow down the progression. You know, we're testing now for that reason that you mentioned. And that is, yeah, Scott, you mentioned earlier about preventing DKA, mm-hmm. which is a big deal. We're, we're testing so that we can tell people, hey, your sugar is going to get high. We can't tell you when, but you better watch out and start measuring it and, and be attentive to it. And that will help you prevent DKA. That's, that's, that's a big reason. Right. The other reason is that there is a medicine currently that is available, that is approved to delay diabetes in people who have stage two. So you have to have stage two. Remember the antibodies and the kind of prediabetes numbers to qualify for it, but it delays and it delays it for forever. No, we don't, we don't know that. We don't really know how long it delays it. We do know that if you look at a time to progression to the next stage, that is overt diabetes. It was an, on an average four years in people who were treated with that medicine. And it was, it was two years in people on placebo. So, you know, nice prolongation delay, nice delay. Did it prevent? We can't say that at all. And we don't even know the long term. Do we need to retreat people? It's a one-time treatment. But now we have a medicine that can delay the onset of going on to have stage three or to have overt diabetes. And that's another reason to screen. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few studies going on currently, not as many as we'd all like, but a few that are testing other agents. And if people know they have antibodies, stage one or two, then they might get into one of those studies if they elect not to take the delay treatment. So there, there's a lot of rumble in this space in the pre kind of pre-stage three diabetes mm-hmm. type one. If a person knows their antibodies and knows their status, they they're in the driver's seat too. They get to kind of make a choice. Yeah. So not only just quality of life in the short term, but if you're one of those people who has a very, very slow onset and you're living with average blood sugars in the 120s, but you aren't into the 126, I mean, you are degrading, right? You, you're doing damage you to your body. Yeah. 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 And just because you don't maybe feel it in the moment, like maybe it's like, oh, I'm tired a lot or, you know what I mean? Like right. something that you can write off for something else. It doesn't mean that as time collects, you're not going to wake up one day and either, of course, boom, have diabetes or have other issues that come from elevated blood sugars that don't qualify as diabetes in the moment. Yeah, I really agree with that. Yeah. Knowledge is power. And uh, I used to hear, well, I don't want to know because there's nothing I can do about it, number one. Number two, I don't want to test my family member because that might make them, you know, upset. These are various reasons that people have given to, say, not screen. 
Oh, I think all of those. Re- I mean, I do understand those reasons, and people have their reasons, and that they're they're in charge of themselves. Bottom line, though, really now there are reasons to know. And they're better and better reasons to know. Prevent, and I know this is kind of redundant, but it's certainly worth saying over and over again. Prevent DKA, maybe get involved with a medicine that might delay, maybe get involved in a study, or maybe just know. You don't have to do any of those things. You just know and right. prevent DKA. And, you know, get get ready and get everything kind of organized and all that. Yeah. Is there a reason, I'm thinking of this one episode that, that, I, that I've done in the past, this gentleman, 50, I think he's 50 years old. He's diagnosed type one and he uses insulin, you know, for six years. Sure. And then one day his doctor suggests, maybe you should take Manjaro for your weight and maybe it'll help you with some of your insulin resistance. Right. And now he hasn't been on insulin for a couple of years. Now he's got type one diabetes. He's got the, he's got his antibodies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he fully expects that one day he's going to be back using insulin again. But now he's, right. he's got this moment in time where, you know, something else is helping him. And what, I mean, that something else could be any number of things, because I think the idea is, I don't know how to say this. Like, I don't want it to, I don't want it to seem like scary, but like, if you were driving in a car, Dr. Blevins, that you were going to go off yes. this cliff 60 years from now, and I could do something to make you go off the cliff 70 years from now, like, let's do that thing. Sure. Yeah. Right. Like that to me is yeah. it's, it's a lot. I'll say again, it's a lot about your quality of life in the moment, but it's also a lot about, you know, a long and healthy life as well. I love the idea of knowing, and I, and I do take your point and I agree. There are some people who might just say for my own mental health, I can't, I don't think I, I could know this information. Right. Right. Personal decision for certain. Yeah. But anyway, it's just kind of how I think about it, I guess. Yeah. I think people still make that decision. They'll decide they don't want to know, but it's it's it, but but I think it's important they they be uh, educated to say, hey, you probably really ought to know because just what you said, we can uh, no matter what we decide to do, it's good to know, yeah. and why not? And so uh, I think I think that that the sort of not wanting to know is kind of a bit of a mindset, and it's kind of ingrained a little bit. But I think this is the time to get everybody off that that center and say, hey, you need to know. And you need to screen everybody in your family so they can know. Yeah. And you know, screening's not screening also is not over at the at the first screen. You have to keep looking every so often because things change. This is truly the dawn of a new era. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody, once they kind of understand that, will get on board with that too. Yeah. And I hope everybody becomes advocates because it it really I liked it to a stone. You have to really push it hard and get it moving and finally get some momentum and it starts rolling on its own a little bit. Mm. This is big and it's the dawn of a new era. It's a whole nother angle. The current organizations like Breakthrough Type 1 Diabetes is totally behind this idea of screening and trying to delay and trying to discover other treatments that might delay and maybe someday prevent. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So what are the risks of developing Type 1 if you have a first degree relative that has Type 1? Yeah, and this is one of those know your numbers things, and you get to get to decide which number you want to know. I would let me advise everyone to. There's so many different numbers, it can drive you a little crazy, but you know, if a first degree relative has type one, the person's risk of having type one versus the general population is about fifteen one five times normal. So that's one number, and to me, that's that's enough, fifteen times, and then. Another way to look at it is what about certain family members? Well, we have data. If a person's mother has type 1, mm. their risk is about 3%. Of course, the, in the population of people who don't have relatives, it's like quite low at 0.4%. The 3% may not seem like a high number, but relatively speaking, it is. And then if the father has type 1, it's about 5%. For some reason, if the father has type 1, the risk of the offspring is a little higher and then the sibling is about 8%. We can go on and on. But know your number. I like the 15 times. And, and there are other ways to look at this, too. I could drive you a little batty. I have a question, though, based on my, my experience talking to people. Is there data for if both parents have an autoimmune issue, but not necessarily type 1? You know, your points are really well taken, and that is that other autoimmune conditions other than diabetes also with signal increased risk of autoimmune glandular like diabetes. But do we have data on that? Not that I know of, Mm -hmm. but your point is so true that if family members, so the, so that you might say the, the straightforward screening group 
would be to screen the the offspring, first degree relatives, or you know they might be offspring of people with diabetes. Screen them. That's where you get the biggest bang for your buck in a way. But ninety percent of people with diabetes type one do not have a positive family history. Well, wow. wow. Mm. So how do you find them? Well, you do what you said. You look at people who have other autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you know, thyroid, adrenal autoimmune, even like celiac, things yeah. like that, even rheumatoid. Yeah. And then if you have a lot of that in the family, then your your risk, you would, you know, logically would be higher to even have another autoimmune condition like type one. Not much data on that, but clearly that's another group to go after and screen the offspring or first degree relatives of, of those people. People have those conditions. And still, it, there's a lot of randomness too. The only way to pick up everybody and everybody who might be not developed type one would be to screen the entire population. And that's not going to happen right now. And there are people talking about that, doing screenings of children like every child. Right now, that's not happening. I mean, that's a really interesting thing to think about. Food for a lot of thought, but but not food that we're going to eat today. So what you can do today is screen people who have family history. And you're right. People who have a history of other autoimmunity should be screened as well. How does ethnicity play into this? Yeah, ethnicity, uh, you know, I think I think people have the concept that, that people with type 1 mainly are people who are Caucasian. And, and in fact, it is true that 72% of the type 1 population in, in this country it would be considered non-Hispanic white. And interestingly, though, and this is where these, these misconceptions get busted, about 15.7% of the type 1 population is Hispanic. And then non-Hispanic black, 9.3%, and Asian about 24 So, you know, there are lots of misconceptions, and that's one of them. And so think about type 1, really any ethnic group, and the, the growth in, in the di- type 1, the greatest growth, when you're talking about relative growth, is in, in the Hispanic and the non-Hispanic black group. You know, I want to go backwards just for a second, but we talked about hey, maybe if there's thyroid or other autoimmune in your line, but does that open you up to be eligible for screening? Like, who do they say no to at, at the moment? Do you know what I mean? Like, what do you have to have on your on your chart for someone to say you're eligible yeah. to be screened? If you take insulin or sulfonylureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready with Gvoke Hypopen. My daughter carries Gvoke Hypopen everywhere she goes because it's a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly, and they demand quick action. Luckily, Gvoke Hypopen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Gvoke Hypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Gvoke Hypopen before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Gvoke Hypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at gvokeglucagon.com slash juicebox. Gvoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Yeah, you know something. Uh, we, by the way, we're still learning what that answer is. Okay. For the most part, the diagnosis of uh, family history of diabetes or or autoimmune disease or endocrine disease is probably the best diagnosis code to use. And because you're screening the person who doesn't have a condition, and you're trying to find out if they do. And what you said is so true. We're we're learning. We know what to do. We know what tests to do. How do we get those covered for people so that they can do them without great difficulty? That's another another challenge. That's been worked on, and I'll mention uh, something here in a minute, anytime you want me to, about particular effort that looks like it's fairly cost-effective and relatively inexpensive that would allow large numbers of people, even if they don't have coverage, to get covered. We are still making our way through that one. Number one, there's a cost, certainly, to the antibodies, and number two, We'd like to get them covered. We want to know. We don't want costs to get in the way. I mean, I'm just talking about the collective we in the medical world and and the people who have diabetes. 
we don't want costs to get in the way of having people do what they should do. And uh, so we're still learning about that. Okay. I want to know about the antibodies. There's five. Is that right? Or six? There are five. Oh, no, wait. Five. Okay. Well, there are four good ones and there are five. And and I'll, I'll kind of give you a bit of a coverage of, of those. There's the, the uh, anti-insulin antibody, and that's a good one. There's a GAD antibody, glutamic acid decarboxylase. That's a really good one, too. And then there's the antibody called the insulinoma-associated antibody, and that's a good one. And then there's a zinc transporter, all these strange names. So GAD antibody, insulinoma-associated antibody 2, insulin, anti-insulin antibody, zinc transporter. Those are the best, four. Mm -hmm. Then there's one called the islet cell antibody, and we do that one, but it's probably the least accurate of the whole group. Okay. And so do the more antibodies you do, the better clarity you get. And the, there are different panels that are run by different groups. And in our own office here, we run the four that I mentioned, but not the islet cell, because those are, we think, the most accurate. And that's kind of what the literature would say. There's a group called TrialNet, and they're around the country, and they'll do antibodies too because they're looking for people. They're really looking for people that, that, that have this stage two, and they're also you know, enrolling people in studies. And they do the GAD and the, and the anti-insulin antibody. And then there, there are various groups. The Barbara Davis group in Colorado will provide a screening kit to people, and they do all of the four antibodies that I mentioned. They, too, exclude the islet cell antibody. And then there are various uh, groups that, that offer screening. If you want to do screening, you know, what do you do? And we can talk about that whenever you'd like to. No, I, I would like to know more. I also want to say that currently, as we record this screen for type one.com is a sponsor of the podcast. I just want to be, I want to be oh, good. like clear about that. So that people understand. Okay. Yeah. That is excellent because I was about to say, if people want to go learn more about screening, they can, I mean, so they, they could go to, I have it written down right in front of me, screen for type one. Oh, awesome. And the musician, a very well-known musician has jumped in to help increase awareness. And that would be Usher. Usher yeah. is, is there. You know, go on that site and take a look. And it'll also let people kind of sign up for a screening kit and tell them what the cost would be based on their insurance. I mean, I can't go into great detail about that because you really have to go on the site to figure that out. But, but I'll give that even more airplay screen. For type onecom yep. That's the site, I That's believe. That's it. That is it. Yeah. They've been with me for a, a, a bit now. And oh, good. Yeah. I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to hear. Because, you know, when it comes down to it, we're talking about screening and how do you do it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I see a patient in my office who has type one, I'm going to say, you should get your kids screened. You know, do it. Can I order it? I don't see their children. I don't. I can't do that. I can't order it, but I can recommend it. Some people I see have relatives who have type 1, and I'll say, hey, I'm going to do a screening on you. Or I see a person who has an elevated blood sugar, and I decide you're going to get screened. They're not, they're not in the diabetes range yet, but, and maybe they are, but I'm going, to, I'm going to screen them if they're my patient. I can do that, and I can write the diagnosis code that, that I find to be the most useful. But I can't order screening in people uh, that are family members. So what do I do? Well, I, I have a little sign on the back of one of my doors, and it says, here are the antibodies you should get done. Talk to your doctor. But another way to go about that is to go to that site, screenfortype1.com. That kind of a site is going to help us all get people screened and really kick, kick up the gain. And there'll be other ways to do it in the future. And everybody's struggling. This is a kind of a new site, down of a new era. New things have to be learned and have to be developed. How... um often do I get, so if I say, uh, I don't know, I have my, my child's screen, they don't have any antibodies. Do I do it again or is once enough? That is a really, really important point. And the answer is if they're negative, or you might ask yourself, are you home free? And the answer is no. Do we really know the final answer as to how often someone should be screened? Not really. But the current, current suggestion is rescreen in, in a few years. And and keep keep looking because these antibodies can crop up at different times. And also, what about people who have antibodies positive and they don't have type full full blown stage three? There's a consensus guidance that's been recently published. This whole science is starting to grow 
and it essentially says, oh, re- recheck their glucoses routinely, uh, see if there's any sign of progression. They might want to get into the treatment that we talked about. They might want to get into a study. And it goes through this whole list of kind of follow-up because, no, you're not home free once you have a negative test. And that's, that's an important bit of information, yet you want to keep checking. We, we do, the final answer to all this is not totally clear. You know, if a person's screened, they've, they're found to have these autoantibodies, then they're going to go forward with the medication. Like, what's available right now? The medicine, there, there's exactly one medicine that's available that is approved to delay type 1 diabetes. And it is the medicine to Pluzumab. And it's all, the brand name is the T-Zild med. So that's the one that I mentioned earlier was, was shown to delay the time of progression to stage three, uh, about on average four years in the group of people treated versus two years in the people who are on placebo. Remember, these are people with essentially stage two. They don't have diabetes yet, but we know they're going to progress on. So the people that were treated median time, that is more or less a time without progression, mm-hmm. four years versus two. Four years, two more years on average of no diabetes, no progression to stage three. Does science know how it works or is it just one of those things we know works and we're not sure why? <laughs> science thinks it knows. Uh, actually, this drug, teflizumab, is an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody. And let me just explain that a little bit. Mm-hmm. T-cells in your body identify beta cells that make insulin as being foreign. It's a mistake. And then they attack them and they attack them and they attack them until they knock them out. And that's why it takes time. It takes time. There are millions and millions of beta cells, but they have to be knocked out for the most part to, for a person to have high blood sugar. This drug is an anti-CD3 antibody. What it does is it interacts with a component, like a, one of the regulators of the T cell. Now, T cells are in your body. They help you. I mean, they, they protect you from foreign things and things you don't want in your body, but they're making a mistake here and they're attacking one of your own cells. Not good, but, it, but it's what happens. Well, if you go in and, and have an antibody that sort of goes against one of the regulators of the T cell, the CD3, then you can deactivate those T cells and you can cause them to be sort of exhausted. And, and that's what t does. It interacts with the CD3 part of the T-cells, inactivating them. Not all of them, of course, but knocks them down. That kind of s- slows that process way down against the beta cell and allows the beta cells to hang on longer. And, and so that's what it does. Okay. Well, that's awesome. That's cr- and you say there's other drugs, too, that are under investigation at this point or no? Yeah, there there are other drugs, and there are other drugs that are being investigated. And I can I can tell you that the breakthrough type one diabetes group, you know, which is of course you all know was the JDRF, and they renamed. Right, is looking at another drug called baricitinib. It's a it inhibits a different component, but same idea. And and so there there are other drugs that are being studied. And and I can tell you that though I know nothing about this. There, I know there are other other ones following behind. Mm-hmm. Also, they're going to be looked at. So, if a person's in stage two, they qualify for a T zealed, and mm-hmm. then it's, I guess, you know, that game of going through insurance and whatnot. But then, once once they're you're okayed for the drug, what's the process of of getting it? Yeah, you have to have just the right criteria. Number one. So, you're talking about how do you get the drug? It's not straightforward. It's actually the process is straightforward, but it's a fairly expensive med. It costs like, I think, about $200,000 per treatment. And I'll tell you more about the treatment in a minute, too. But so you have to go very carefully through the approval process. And then the company has, uh, you know, some things they can do. And the insurance companies look at it very carefully. It's a brand new, it's not brand new as much as it's just very still low usage. And they're going to spend a lot of time. We've treated one person here, and I have another person who's hopefully in the wings to be treated soon, and it's a slow process. And when, when people are waiting, I tell them, hey, check your blood sugar, keep me informed. But, but it's, it's, it's something that has to be approved by the insurance. It takes time. Then this is a treatment that's an IV-administrated 
medicine 14 days in a row. You have to have a place that can can treat people on Saturday and Sunday for at least a couple couple times, a couple weekends. And and that's that's very doable here, but it's not doable everywhere. Okay. And and so there there are certainly factors. And then the medicine does have potential side effects, and those have to be monitored for. So it's a process. Yeah. And so what what are the common are there common side effects or no? Yeah. yeah. There, there actually are. One side effect that I'll mention that is occurs in about 2% of people, which is the low percent, but still happens, is cytokine release syndrome. That's just simply when you give a medicine like this, you get a release of a lot of kind of inflammatory substances from the T cells and from the immune system. And that can lead to like fever, rash, nausea, vomiting, and can be disturbing. It also could lead to elevation of liver tests and things like that. This medicine could with the cytokine release syndrome. So these things all have to be monitored for. They're kind of, ex- they're not like expected, like where it's going to happen is 2% of people, but it's not a, it's not an allergy. It's, it's a reaction to the medicine. So with treatment, we're going to monitor the liver tests. And if they go up a certain amount, we're going to stop the medicine. We, we watch the, the white blood cell count. It can drop. We watch the lymphocytes in particular because they can drop. And if they drop to a certain level, then we would stop the medication. There's a somewhat of an increased risk of infection when people are getting the medication. And the good news is that lymphocytes tend to rebound. And uh, those are those are symptoms that are manageable. We give people antipyretics, you know, like acetaminophen, for example, or nonsteroidals too. And we give people anti nauseals Those are ways to mitigate the, the symptoms. Right. So the top four adverse reactions are going to be lymphopenia. That happens. That's the lymphocytes, uh, the white cells. And it, then they do fight infection. So we don't want them to go too low. Lymphopenia, about three quarters of people. Rash can happen in about 35, 36%. And leukopenia, that means low white blood cell count, 21% or so, and a headache too. And so those are all things that we, we know can happen. It doesn't mean there's an allergy. It's a, it's a reaction to the medicine that's, that's kind of expected. And we just have to kind of get people through that. You have one person, you said, who's been through the process and one person you're trying to get set up for. Does anything about the possible side effects stop you from suggesting it to patients? You know, I'm an endocrinologist, and I'm not really all that used to using immunologics, although some of the medicines we use are monoclonal antibodies, like to treat osteoporosis, for example. And when I first looked at this, I thought, gosh, those are some side effects I want to be really careful about. But the truth is, with proper monitoring and with the right place to give the infusion, that is a, a an infusion. We use an infusion center here in Austin. And it's been doable. We know that there are certain certain side effects that are potential, and so we're we're prepared. And the, the you know the, I guess there could be surprises, but we're always ready for that. But but uh, this is outpatient. People walk in, get the infusion, they go home, and they go back the next day. They, they do it for two weeks. It's an infusion for two weeks. You know the pause that I had initially is kind of uh, has passed. Okay. And I educate the people very carefully. The the person that's waiting right now talk to her very often about the potential side effects and she's very aware yeah you're a proponent absolutely yeah yes okay. I, I listen i used to have to get iron infusions and yeah. you know the first time somebody says mm-hmm. it to you you're like well it sounds frightening but then it's yeah. it's not you know i don't actually i don't have to get them anymore since i've been on a glp med but that's yeah. a, a different yeah. thing yeah. uh but but nevertheless, it's just it's not as it's not as scary as you think it is. Is you know, no. I guess my point. I know what you're saying. Iron is different than this. Sure. This is an immunologic and a CD3 antibody. But you read through the side effects of iron infusions. You saw that it could cause probably a reaction at mm-hmm. the at the infusion site. It could cause a diffuse reaction. There are things that these infusions can do, and I think it's really, really important for the person who's being considered for this to be really assertive about finding out all the potential side effects and be ready. Sure. And uh, that that's really, really important. Yeah, I'm not comparing the two. I just even meant no. the idea of going to an infusion center yeah. seems kind yeah. of like off-putting, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. But it's not, it's uh, just, it's not bad at all. 
and you have this great thing of being in a place where these people do the same thing over and over again. They're very, at least in my experience, they're good at it. They know what they're doing. It runs well, like that kind of stuff. They so, are. Yeah, they are. And that we're really happy with the infusion center that we use because they, that's what they do. Yeah. They do infusions and they infuse all kinds of different things. Yeah. So they are quite ready. I think some practitioners might end up doing their infusions in their office and that's okay too. Mm-hmm. As long as you monitor people and check blood pressure, check temperature, and and it's essentially walk in, walk out. So different offices are going to come up with different ways of doing it. Some people may do it in the outpatient facility at a hospital, which is essentially the same thing as an infusion room. Mm-hmm. And there, there are different ways that this will be uh, administered. And the possible side effects, they exist during the infusion. But once the infusion time is over, are they? there's no side effects left. Is that right? Well, that is true, although you can still see some white count uh, changes later on. The rash could even continue on well past the time of of the administration. Liver test elevations could occur later, too, and continue. And so we continue to monitor people for a few weeks. Most, For the most part, any of that effect is going to be gone after two to four weeks. But it is important to not only monitor during the infusion process, but also after for a few weeks. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Blevins, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? I think uh, one thing that I found that's important for people to realize too, is that we talk about screening and, and some people have the idea, well, people over the age of 20, they can't get diabetes. So we don't need to bother screening them. And that's totally, totally not true. Mm -hmm. What's interesting and even surprises me when I see the numbers that 59% 59% of the people diagnosed with type 1 are over the age of 20. You think it's like oh, kids and teenagers and adolescents and all, but and so it's a pretty large population. So that's never too late to screen, I guess you might say. I think that's the other thing I wanted to, to talk about and just to let people know that, you know, if a person has risk, then type 1 can happen at any any age. Yeah, I have... I'd have to go back to check to be 100% sure, but I believe that I've interviewed someone who has personally or their child has been diagnosed at every age from one up into the 60s. So, yeah. 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 I've got it covered pretty much. I think so. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I really do. I, I know this is not a, probably not an exciting topic for people, but I think it's very important and, and I appreciate that you uh, that you thought so too and wanted to come on and do it. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having yeah, me. No, and thank you. This is really enjoyable. And I really like talking about this subject because uh, when I went into, uh, for one thing, when I went into endocrinology years ago, there was no delay. It was a lot of talk, but there was really nothing. And we, we would like, a, you know, we would all like a cure and some kind of way to just give some cells and it's all over with. That's certainly making its way along. I think the pace is picked up there, but this is a totally important angle that is to delay or eventually, hopefully pick up people who have this, these antibodies who are going to go to diabetes or always have, always have in the past and say, just alter the course of the disease and delay it or prevent it. So I think this is something everybody should know about and really be talking to their the family about. And, and so get screened and go look at that that website. I think that's actually a pretty, very informative website. Right. Yeah, listen, as, as exciting as the idea is to be able to delay the onset of type 1, the other excitement is what are they going to learn from this? Right. And where does it go from here? And exactly. is there going to be a time in the future where you're screened, you have that autoantibody, they give you something and you don't develop type 1? And that would be, I mean, that would be crazy. And for all the people living with type one, you know, I agree. Just think about that for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody jump up and help push that rock. I talked about earlier forward and get some momentum and keep it rolling. Yeah. No, I appreciate that very much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Blevins, if you'll hold on for a second, I have a question for you, but not for while we're recording. Thanks again. We'll do. We'll do. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. 
U.S. Med sponsored this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Check them out at usmed.com slash juicebox or by calling 888-721-1514. Get your free benefits check and get started today with U.S. Med. You can use the same continuous glucose monitor that Arden uses. All you have to do is go to dexcom.com slash juicebox and get started today. That's right. The Dexcom G7 is sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. From the very beginning, your kids mean everything to you. That means you do anything for them, especially if they're at risk. So when it comes to type 1 diabetes, screen it like you mean it. Now, up to 90% of type 1 diagnoses have no family history. But if you have a family history, you are up to 15 times more likely to develop type 1. Screen it like you mean it because type 1 diabetes can develop at any age. And once you get results, you can get prepared for your child's future. So screen it like you mean it. Type 1 starts long before there are symptoms, but one blood test could help you spot it early, before they need insulin, and could lower the risk of serious complications like diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. Talk to your doctor about how to screen for type 1 diabetes, because the more you know, the more you can do. So don't wait. Tap now or visit screenedfortype1.com to learn more. Again, that's screenedfortype1.com and screen it like you mean it. If you or a loved one was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and you're looking for some fresh perspective, the Bold Beginning series from the Juice Box podcast is a terrific place to start. That series is with myself and Jenny Smith. Jenny is a CDCES, a registered dietitian, and a type one for over 35 years. And in the Bold Beginning series, Jenny and I are going to answer the questions that most people have after a type one diabetes diagnosis. The series begins at episode 698 in your podcast player, or you can go to juiceboxpodcast.com and click on Bold Beginnings in the menu. I can't thank you enough for listening. Please make sure you're subscribed or following in your audio app. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you've noticed that the podcast sounds better and you're thinking like, how does that happen? What you're hearing is Rob at Wrong Way Recording doing his magic to these files. So if you want him to do his magic to you, wrongwayrecording.com. You got a podcast? You want somebody to edit it? You want Rob.